Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, the first item on the agenda today is uh, apologies. I've had um, several apologies from councillors uh, Ali, Driver, Gwyn, Lancaster, Adele, and uh, Susan Emmett. Uh, are there any other apologies? I think that's everyone. Okay, this, the second item on the agenda is a, a, a sort of a urgent business. Um, uh, as uh, Councillor Gwynne isn't here today, we need to appoint a chair just for this meeting. Uh, so I'm just seeking some nominations for, the, for that role today. Okay, he's seconded. Thank you. Any other nominations? Okay, Councillor. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Committee. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the uh, Greater Manchester Waste and Recycling Committee. Uh, may I remind members and everybody else that this has been webcast, so on our best behaviour. And also, when you want to speak, obviously press the, uh, the intercom button. Once you stop speaking, press it again. Thank you. Right, first, next item is uh, Declaration of Interest. No declarations of interest. Okay. Next is the, the minutes of the last meeting. These have been circulated. So for those that were present at the last meeting, if somebody can agree them and second them, please. Second it. Thank you, Councillor Rahman and Councillor Basford. Right, move on to item five. Committee work program. This is uh, sent out by David, uh, David Taylor, regarding some of the work program for this committee over the coming months. So the report is for noting. It's setting out the uh, forecast program covering. Future meeting budget um, agendas will be set using this as the basis. Any comments from members? Councillor Quinn? Thanks, Chair. Um, going through that, the paper in general, this is on the, uh, the works. Can you, is it for another part of the meeting, or can you update us on the, what's happening at Rakes Lane, you know, with the turbine going in? If we can pick that up under the um, Part 3 contract update. Yeah, fine, thank you. Thanks, Chair. The next uh, item is the, uh, the register of uh, key GMCA decisions. David? Um, it's, it's just for noting again, Chair, so it's just uh, notif notifying members of any sort of uh, waste and recycling issues that are going to be part of uh, the GMCA's um, key decision. Thank you. Members, any comments on that? Okay, so we know that report. Next, we move into the Part A of the Waste Management Contract uh, update. Uh, Justin? Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, just to uh, introduce this report, it's the um, figures up to June and July, which were uh, the point at which this report was, was compiled. That was the verified figures. Um, if we look at the total risings, we're up at nearly 196,000 um, tons uh, that have come in over that period, of which nearly 94,000 tons were recycled, giving us a recycling rate of 47, nearly 48%. Um, landfill disposal diversion um, for nearly nine, well 94 percent, 94.3, and a recycling rate over at the household waste recycling centres uh, approaching 42 percent there, with the household waste diversion away from landfill up to nearly 94. If you include the arisings of rubble and other non-household items into there, you'd be up at nearly 95 percent. Uh, of the refuse-derived fuel that we've produced and sent to Runcorn for uh, combined heat and power production, uh, 120,000 tonnes sent uh, in, the, in, the, in the financial year with steam and electricity exported figures there over to the, uh, the Ineos Claw plant uh, for, the, for their uh, processing. Uh, at Bolton, Rakes Lane Thermal Recovery Facility, whilst the facility continues to process material, um, and divert away from landfill. At the moment, the electricity turbine is waiting to refurbish and reinstallation of the new turbine, so there's no electricity being produced at that site at this moment in time. For the Longley Lane Materials Recovery Facility over at, um, at Sharston, um, the curbside 
recycling rejections, which is material delivered and not making it into the process because the load was contaminated. A total of 126 tonnes has been rejected to date. And the contamination rate, which is the other end of the processing, where the facility has rejected certain materials from its, um, from its throughput, uh, we're up at 17.8%, approaching 18%, which has been um, along the lines of the average rejection rates over, over this uh, period. Taking you into the health and safety, uh, unfortunately there were two RIDOR incidents in, in July. One of those, uh, both of those actually were from lost time accidents. Um, one of them was a manual handling incident where an operative removed uh, the old cathode ray tube type television from, a, from the wrong area where a member of public had placed it down. It had been, he had to move it into the correct area and trapped his finger and broke his knuckle, unfortunately there. Um, the lessons learned from that have been manual handling and also the meet and greet to make sure that when materials are delivered, they're put in the first, in the first instance, they're delivered to the right area of the site. We also had a, a slip um, trip uh, fall incident where a member of uh, staff went into a bonded area and st stood on an unsecured walkway. Uh, that had been left there from a previous uh, piece of work and unfortunately slipped and had a, a muscle trauma injury as, as a result of that. That was right at the end of July, so that will also appear in the August figures because the, uh, the time they were uh, unable to return to work uh, went into August. And the lessons learned from that have been that when a, a job has been carried out, um, now the, the supervision have a, a process where they will check the area and return any, any materials or equipment uh, to their correct places. Um, and also accessing areas has been addressed with, uh, with, the, with the operatives. Um, to look at the works across the sites, we have works going on uh, on, on our materials and tre treatment and uh, reception facilities. Uh, Cobden Street over at Salford, the site is now commissioned and fully operational. It's been handed back to Suez and the, um, the process of processing in there is now fully underway. Redbury in Stockport, uh, the me mechanical and uh, electrical works are now programmed for early December completion. The kit is in place and it's now about getting them up and running and, and, in, and into full operation, which we're hoping now will be the early part of December. Over at Rakes Lane, energy from waste facility, um, that reopened after its plan shut down. Uh, all works carried out and is now uh, back in operation. Nash Road, Trafford Park is the, uh, the, the old uh, in-vessel composting site uh, that has been removed and uh, the conversion is now underway to make, the, uh, make way for the new reuse hub that we placed there. Reliance Street, Newton Heath, North Manchester, um, the modification of what was previously the maturation building for the, for the digested material that would have come out of the MBT facility, that has now been converted into a temporary transfer loading station. That's to facilitate the works that will be happening to the previous reception hall into a new mechanical treatment uh, reception facility. And that will allow the districts to continue their deliveries into the site and transfer it out to other op operational MTR sites to feed um, the um, refuse dry fuel to Runcorn. Chichester Street up in Rochdale. Um, the work up there now to put in the new bio waste transfer loading station after the um, the IVC building, build, IVC building that was lost to fire, that has now been uh, completely demolished and pile testing is going on along with the slab demolition, demolition work so that uh, that new building can be created there and, and the good news is amended planning, planning application has been approved for that facility. Um, the previous GMCA meeting approved the access restriction policy for our household waste recycling centres to prevent the wrong materials going into that, to present non-domestic and trade waste being presented into those sites. Um, the implementation date now has been set with Suez for the 10th of February. That will mean in between now and then there'll be a joint plan to develop between the contractor and, and the WCA districts uh, to put in place communications, training, signage, to install the um, automatic number plate recognition cameras to facilitate the, uh, the measuring of, of, of the amounts of vehicles and which vehicles have been how many times to each site or to all sites. Um, drawing up letters for complaint responses, as we know we'll get some, some uh, level of uh, alignment of people understanding what we need to do at these sites and what the correct use is. Um, and then arranging um, the data sharing so we can do that in line with GDPR with our internal government information governance team and um, looking at also around the sites how we can develop a better method of preventing people doing traders for instance 
parking and walking in parking restrictions uh, and also looking at existing fly tipping data so we can measure any any changes that occur over the time um, pack, a pack will be um, developed and that will be given out to uh, to members to um, offices in the WCAs to help desks so that they can have the right information at their fingertips when questions come in and uh, the comms plan being developed starting from next week it'll be a two-phase pre-Christmas to get them into the idea to start disseminating the information and uh, and then a post-Christmas in preempting the beginning of the uh, of the scheme in February uh, which will involve the uh, the mediums there that we'll talk about handing you over then to um, Michael you can just pause there I beg your pardon yeah Members, any, any questions on that? Yeah. Councillor Greedo. Yeah, thank you. Well, no, page 23, yeah, uh, on the two point, the table at 2.3. Um, it's just the last two items there. You mentioned that 17.8% uh, was pretty average. Uh, but is that 126 tonnes? Is that an increase or a decrease? Uh, how is that stacking up? It's slightly lower. It's just as high as it has been. Um, Pardon, sorry, yeah, as it has, has been. Of, um, we have had um, more, more, should we say, concentration on the mixed paper and card, uh, and we have had, had noticed in there there's been a little bit more of an increase in that in that area. But overall, I would say it is slightly lower than it has been overall. Yeah. It does seem to be quite some confusion amongst people in terms of the paper and card and, and so on. Uh, I, I know my area certainly. Uh, uh, there seems to be quite a lot rejected that you would think would actually be acceptable. Uh, are we looking at that to see whether we can be more flexible? It is very much in the hands of the outlet markets. Um, so I agree there has been a lot of alignment required for the, for the public's view of what can go in to, those, to, to all recyclable streams. And it's certainly something that we've focused on and put a lot more information out. If you look on the website there, we've got a great deal of information that's come from the communication side to make sure it's very explicit what can go in. To answer your question on, on, on looking at what the markets can give, obviously it's very market driven. There's been a global change in the requirements for mixed paper and card materials, particularly with the Chinese market becoming a lot more um, stringent in what they think is, is acceptable and what they want for their outlet markets. So we certainly are up against a more, uh, should we say, a more rigorous contamination regime because the outlet markets ultimately um, are demanding it. Um, so flexibility is, is becoming probably something that is more, uh, is less likely to be something we can be with that because the markets are saying they want much cleaner streams. Thanks, yeah. I mean, I think it's good to bring this up as we're talking on paper and cards. I mean, on one hand, I think that the, the Chinese the rejection rate, they, they brought it down to 0.5 or 1%, where I think the GM average is something like is it 8% or even higher. But I think generally with, with the climate change debate emergency, that we, we shouldn't be sending anything to China because of the carbon footprint. And I believe that is all our paper now being sourced to Trafford? So it's basically being done in Manchester. At this moment in time, um, the, the Trafford facility um, is being developed, um, but we have an outlet here, it's actually North Wales, uh, and we also have for more for the more difficult material, in some areas there are, are materials coming out where the, the contamination is higher, and we have, a, if you like, an intermediary group there who do some clean-up work. So they are based out uh, Wigan, Wigan direction um, and like I say in the main plant being out in, in North Wales eventually yeah the Carrington plant in Trafford will be coming online but that, that is underway a 10-year low on pricing, and that's a, a global issue at the moment. Councillor Rahman. Thanks, Chair. Yeah. I did have a question around the communication strategy to do with the HWRCs, but I think your last slide has addressed that. But can I just request that perhaps we can have a little briefing note for elected members, because at the last 
council meeting in Oldham, uh, concern was raised around some of the um, issues around how it's going to be implemented, um, etc. So I think certainly from Oldham's point of view, it would be useful uh, that if you can have a, a, like an A4 uh, briefing paper so we can distribute it to elected members. Um, that is in the communications plan, so we are planning on such a big change to make sure that you're fully briefed and we're working up at the moment. Um, a briefing note that outlines the policy and the changes and the communications we're going to do and then a frequently asked questions list of things that you might get asked by your residents or traders. So that is in progress, yeah. Uh, thank you for that. Is there a, like a date uh, set when we can expect that to be published? Because we're in the PERDA period, I think we'll be distributing that after the 12th of December. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, just, just on the comms, I mean, I do have some kind of reservations in terms of the timing. Christmas, New Year time, I mean, that's the last time people are going to look at kind of the other things on their mind. You, you see where I'm coming from? So is it going to have the reach that we had, would have anticipated? Yeah, we're going to start drip feeding information now. Um, we've got quite a lot of a good established network with the Environment Agency, um, the Chamber of Commerce, um, some internal networks in terms of the Business Growth Hub as well. So we're quite confident we can reach those traders. The, the main changes in terms of residence is just the AMPR. So it shouldn't change their behaviour at all. The whole point of this is to flush out the traders that are illegally using the sites. So we're going to start distributing the actual trade waste packs on site at the beginning of January after the Christmas period. And we're distributing leaflets as well for residents so that we've got different communications for different groups of people. Um, we're going to start with doing some social media now to start raising awareness of duty of care and how you should be using the HWRC. So there's quite an extensive communications plan in place. And we, we, you're right, there's only a small window, but we are confident that we'll get all of that ready and in place before the 10th of February. And then beyond that as well, obviously the comms needs to continue after the 10th of Feb as well. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Move on to the next one, which is the uh, budget and uh, levy setting process. David? Yes, yeah, so this is a report of Sorry. Richard Paver, Treasurer, who is not here today because he is uh, going through some of our budget scrutiny process um, elsewhere. So this is the Part A report, which is providing members with an update on the forecast budget outturn for 2019-20, and then it's also setting out the proposed budget for next year, 2020-21. Uh, there is an accompanying Part B report which details some of the commercial considerations which I will pick up later on in the agenda. So looking at the 1920 budget, the forecast position at the moment is that we are anticipating to be broadly in line with budgets at the end of the year. The only variables on that essentially will be down to what actual tonnages of material districts bring into the system. So the forecast is based on the latest set of tonnage data which came in in November. So looking at the breakdown of, of the budget in there, we have had some additional operating costs while we've been going through the period of uh, modifying the MBT plants, but those have been offset by some of the uh, financing savings. And within the report, it's also identifying uh, an anticipated refund of uh, around a million pounds to come back to districts uh, within the year. The other item that's discussed in the report is the update of the LAMA, the Levy Allocation Methodology Agreement. What we've had to do is review that and update it to reflect the new contracting arrangements and the, the change in the ratio of fixed and variable costs is the principal change within there. So that document is now going through a process of approval through the nine um, councils and then that will go to the CA in January along with the budget for approval. Happy to take any questions. Questions? Yeah, Councillor Best. Um, hi. Uh, for uh, for this, if we do leave the EU, has there been any research into any of the financial implications for next year's budget setting around this? Yes. So we've got um, a Brexit plan which has been developed with Suez, and 
principally the, the risks there will be around um, delays at the ports and whether we can get <coughs> material out for export. Now, as I said um, earlier, there's not actually a lot of our material that we do export, but if other people are having issues exporting material, they will then look to use domestic markets, which potentially could cause some issues for us. So there has been um, analysis of what might be the worst case scenario done around would we then have to either landfill or send material for energy from waste. We don't think we will end up in that position. We're also looking at if we end up with um, a no-deal Brexit, what would that mean for the materials we export if we're working under World Trade Organization tariffs? That is proving more difficult to get a clear understanding of because it's quite impenetrable to get to a definitive answer on, on those, but that work is ongoing. What we have done is built in um, an allowance into the budget for next year for Brexit, which I can talk more about when we get to the Part B report. Um, just to follow up with that, so some of the some of the uh, plans that you're putting into place potentially maybe on the Part B or at a later date, would it be able to circulate some of the some of the scenarios? Thanks, Councillor Lloyd. And also, uh, we're waiting uh, the results of the consultation uh, about bin th um, the general consultation about waste across the country. Uh, is there anything been in the budget being built in for that as well? With the DEFRA consultation, what they talked about was a second round of consultation coming out towards the end of this year. That's now delayed because of the general election on the 12th of December, and there isn't a clear indication from DEFRA when they will come back out for uh, the next round. What they said in the original documentation is that they would go through two rounds of consultation, and then any changes that needed to be made would be brought into legislation by 2023. So we wouldn't need to make any allowance in next year's budget for any changes. Councillor Foster Brown. Yes, thank you. It, it just a brief question to David is um, um, the disastrous implications of leaving the European Union were mentioned. Um, it was over a year ago I first asked the question about um, about the offtake of steam, I think it was from uh, the Innovin Associated plant at Runcorn. Obviously, that provides a substantial contribution to, um, you know, to, to our waste costs. Um, and I'm just thinking that there are companies like that, key partners that we work with, that may very well uh, be affected um, by the uh, potential of any kind of Brexit. And I just wanted reassurance. Um, as I asked, I think it was over a year ago at the National Cycling Centre, that you are taking these risks into account in your financial calculations. Thank you. I think the short answer to that is yes, we are. When we get to the Part B, if you would like me to go into a bit more detail around the commercial arrangements at Runcorn and how that scenario would play out, then I can do. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Ali. Um, we are actually technically in Perda, so, and we have been webcast, so we've got to be careful in respect of any um, positioning statements, like I just heard from my colleague there. Um, whatever our opinions are, we've just got to make it very apolitical at this present moment. I'm sure all officers and all colleagues are aware of that, whichever side of the divide we sit on with any particular opinion on any matter at this present moment. Thank you, Councillor. I'm sure that was unintentional. It wasn't, wasn't intended. Thank you. Any further comments from members on that? Okay, we'll move on to the next uh, item, which is uh, the communication behavioural change strategy. And that's Michelle, I believe, yeah? Thank you, uh, Chair. So I'm just going to run through the report that you've got in front of you, picking out some of the key things. Um, obviously, as you're all aware, this year we've seen a lot of uh, climate change strikes across the globe. So um, we are very aware that we really need to be aligning recycling with climate change, and we're going to start to develop now some messages about how recycling can impact on those reaching those uh, carbon neutrality targets. Um, so we're going to develop some areas of the website that will um, explain the link between recycling and carbon savings. In terms of the main priorities for this next financial year, 
the five main priorities are the ones that we're working to this year. So waste prevention, raising awareness of recycling, educating residents, reducing contamination, and increasing the recycling rate at the HWRCs. Um, in terms of waste prevention, we want to focus on food waste. Um, this is following the recent waste compositional analysis that shows that um, about a quarter of the general waste bin is still made up of food waste. Um, and food, obviously food waste as well links quite heavily into climate change. So we're going to do a Greater Manchester-wide campaign um, regarding food waste prevention, um, probably along the lines of the RAP Love Food Hate Waste campaign, using a whole range of different communication methods. Um, as well as, um, as well as food waste, we're going to focus on the reuse shops as a way of getting that waste prevention message out. They will be open next year. We've not got a date yet, but um, by the summer of next year. So sewers are planning on building three reuse shops at the H uh, household waste recycling centres. And we're going to work with them to develop some messaging about how we want residents to use the um, HWRCs to separate out any waste that can be repaired or resold rather than being thrown away. Um, picking up on some of the comments that have been made in previous uh, meetings, we're going to allocate more budget to digital advertising rather than have the Manchester Evening News package of uh, regular newspaper adverts. We're still going to advertise in local papers, but we want a bit more flexibility around which ones that we advertise in. Um, and picking up as well some of the comments around contamination, our focus is going to be on paper and card next year, following um, everyone's comments. There, are, there is obviously problems with the paper and card market. I noticed in the Let's Recycle today, the, the main news headline is that paper prices are at 10-year low. So... Um, this is a global problem, so that means that it drives the quality. We really need to be making sure that we have better quality paper and card that we're delivering into Psycho when that comes online. Um, some of the main problems that you mentioned, um, Councillor Garrido, about um, what can and can't be recycled that we're seeing, so baby wipes, nappies, electrical items, some of these things we are finding in the paper and card bin. So we've asked Suez to provide us with some more sampling data so that we can real, really try and dig down to identify what the problems are. And then we can work with the local councils to identify some of the key areas and key rounds that they maybe have problems with and target our contam uh, contamination campaign to those areas. Um, increasing recycling at the House of Waste Recycling Centres is also going to feature next year. So once the policy is, is bedded in, we're hoping to see once that trade waste has been deterred away from the HWRC, um, we're hoping to see an increase in recycling rates. Suez are also starting to do a trial in carpet and mattress recycling at a selected number of uh, HWRCs, so that will be rolled out throughout next year. Um, and then... Uh, I've listed on there some of the aims and objectives. We still have um, a, a Greater Manchester-wide survey carried out by RAP that can give us a measure of uh, levels of contamination. Um, and there's still a lot of confusion around what can be put in um, each of the recycling bins. So we know we've still got a lot of work to do on that. And then there's um, a detailed plan at the end of the pack that lists all of the activities broken down with the timescales and the budget allocated and the uh, associated KPIs. Um, so has anybody got any questions? Thank you, Michelle. Councillor Quinn and then Councillor Bestford. Oh, thanks, Chair. Yeah, my, my telly broke down the other day. So I must be one of the few people that actually managed to get it repaired because in the throwaway society, that people just say, my telly broke down, they got a new one. So it's, I'm just thinking, is, is the, would there be a diary or a, a directory of actually people who could repair stuff? Because it, right, I think it cost me 120 quid to get it repaired, but the cost of a new tell is 500. So I've saved myself some money. I've also reused it, in a way. But also, on another sort of more serious point is we, we're sort of hitting a barrier now, I think, for you, where we, we, we've got to a level where we've got the co-mingled contamination around 18%. The, the food is, and, and the card, we, 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 I think 
we've we've uh, we, we've done all the low hanging fruit, and it's the way we're going now is 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 to probably get it. You know, from Betty's point of view, is how do we get above sixty percent towards the sixty five, uh, and even above that? And I I think that myself is education because I, I, I mentioned last time we, in Betty they came around sticking stickers on the, on the inside of your bin lid, and I, and I mentioned that a lot of these bin lids are dirty, and the stickers fell off, and, and they did do. Uh, and I, but I, I do. I think you're right in one way that no one tends to read papers anymore. Um, you know, we're, in, we're into digital, and it's how. I mean, Attenborough did it. They did the one documentary that basically changed everyone's perceptions on plastic. And it's how do we do that as an authority attacking food waste, the commingled, and the paper and card? So um, yeah, just a comment. Thanks, Michelle. Councillor Westford. Um, just picking up on what you said around 8.2 in some of the objectives, um, I've noticed that the, the two tables that are in there, the figures uh, seem to be going up from 2018 to 2019, so going, going the wrong way. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the possible reasons behind that, given the spend on advertising for behavioural change uh, and, and what the plans are to do to mitigate that? Yeah, sure. The the table's probably out of context because that, that's pulled out of a 187 slide deck that we've got from RAP. So statistically speaking, there's no change there from the data they've analysed. Um, the top table is about, they've asked all the residents, um, what was the last thing you put in your recycling bin? And what they found was that most people are still putting at least one item in their recycling bin that, is, that shouldn't go in there. So it could be something quite insignificant. It could be something like, um, I don't know, a yoghurt pot that we don't collect, but they don't know. So it doesn't really give a, a big picture behind the stats. Um, what I will say is that behaviour change is a long-term process and it, we, we're not going to get change overnight. And we're trying lots of different techniques. And what we found is that we need a whole range of different communication methods, but we need to be working in partnership very closely with the local authority so that it's not just us that are pushing out the communications, but the local authority are pushing out communications on their channels as well. Um, the, the table at the bottom is about the serious contamination. So these are things like nappies and electrical items. And again, the messages there, they're all quite complex, so we can only tackle one thing at once. It is quite frustrating, but with two and a half million residents, it's uh, really difficult, but I just would say that it's, it's really important that we keep drip feeding that information. And the trouble is as well, is that there's so much new packaging and new products coming on the market, it's really hard to keep up. There's a lot of manufacturers now that are making bold environmental claims about this can be recycled and it really can't. So that really doesn't help because we don't have the budget of some of these big TV ads that tell you to recycle it when actually locally you can't. So we're still exploring lots of different um, avenues. Um, we're going to do some different types of digital advertising and explore different ways of reaching people and also use some of the partnerships within the GMCA that we've perhaps not used before. So, for example, we're planning on working with FIRE around doing a battery recycling campaign because batteries are one of those serious contaminants that find their way into the bins that cause fires at our sites. So there's quite a lot of new activity going on. Um, so I would just say that there seems to have been um, a shift in... Um, when we first started this project last year, it was the plastics that was causing us a problem, and we seem to have seen less rejected loads um, from Suez, but paper and card has gone up. And, that, and that's sometimes reflected in the market as well, about the quality that they will accept. So it is quite a complex issue, and there isn't just one answer. So we can just keep trying different types of communications, but... I think we just need to make sure that we're always reviewing and monitoring and changing what we do to make sure that we don't rest on our laurels. And if something's not working, we've tried it, but we try something different. Thank you. Councillor uh, Just to pick up on, on your points, really, there, in, in respect of uh, our visit to uh, Longley Lane, and, and the, because we are 10 separate authorities going into one facility, it's quite interesting to understand sort of different contamination rates in, in respect of the different bins. Uh, and I think that is to do with each one of the different authorities having slightly different 
uh, collection days and bins and, and et cetera, et cetera, in, in respect of and Trafford. The, the green bin is, is a particularly high uh, contaminant uh, as opposed to sort of some of the other authorities. And that's maybe down to sort of the, the collection days and methods that, that takes place. The other part of that, which I thought was very interesting uh, on the tour, was uh, the educational side of it. And even, and there's a, a, a brief sort of, you put 15 items, which, which bin do you think they go in? Which things don't they go in? And, you know, Pyrex is a, a perfect example of, a, you know, a non-glass uh, that, that is not supposed to go in there. But how many residents know that? And I think it's perhaps learning from the ground up in respect of having a more dedicated children's education engagement because um, I think that both primary schools and secondary schools teach the older generation now, and maybe that's maybe worth investing and, and looking at in a, in a more serious light, um, other than just the, 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 the uh, stuff that we do at the moment. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I'll just come back on that as well. It's um, a good point because actually within the comms plan for next year, I've put in a budget for recruiting a, another education officer part-time for two and a half days a week. Because what we're finding is we've got two education officers, but two education centres. So when they get fully booked, we're having to turn schools away. So we really want to be able to do more, have more evening visits because we're finding we're getting more interest from community groups, girl guides, boy scouts, that sort of group and be able to also do outreach, because we're finding some of the schools maybe in the north of the borough, Oldham, Bury, are not coming to Long Hill Lane, because it's quite a travel, and it takes a big chunk of time out of school. So we want to be able to go and visit them rather than get them to come to the centre. So we are looking at a different strategy for our education centres in particular for next year. Mm -hmm. the, the lady that we met is, is the manager of Alison and Jess are the two main education officers. It was probably Alison. <laughs> okay, thank you, Michelle. Uh, I've got Councillor Foster Graham. Yes, thank you. Um, is it appropriate to make comments on, and a question at this stage? Yes. Chair, thank you. Uh, as long as it's not political. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Um, I have to say that I've, I've been really impressed by um, this report, Michelle, and um, and all the work that your team is doing because, you know, I can see that you've taken on board comments by members and, and that you're making progress. And I think we both agree, I think we all probably agree, the communications is essential to all our other work, um, you know, actually uh, making progress. Um, the, uh, the, I mean, I can see also, I'm delighted to see, you know, Suez have hit the ground running, and that comes out also in your report. Very pleased to see that you're working together on these communication plans. Thank you very much for taking on board all the comments that, that some of us have made about the digital um, being improved, and I think that that's really, um, you know, that's really important, and I'm sure in the long term, or even in the medium term, we will see dividends on that. Um, also, it's key communications because of the new things that, that we are doing, which um, Suez is now uh, putting into place slowly as part of their original offer, which is the recycling of the mattresses. The reuse shops is, is, a, is a superb idea and letting people know um, that these are there and available, that they can recycle the batteries. Um, also, great to see that their managers, um, I've picked up from your report, are going to be getting electric vehicles, something which I hope, you know, we as a committee would be ambitious for, for, for any vehicles associated um, with the organisation or our organisation in the future. So I suppose the question is, and it's actually related to a comment a colleague just made, so we, we had this discussion already about um, the importance of starting with the younger people and the children and the community groups in helping us get our message out. So I'm delighted to see that you are recruiting uh, another part-time officer, but I really would hope, would there be plans in the future for um, more than just half another officer? Because I think this is a key area that needs to be addressed um, by, by everybody involved in the recycling. Um, is it just a question of that's all the budget you have been given? Um, and, or is there talk that over a period of time 
that this could be increased. Because when you see the reaction of people when they go to these, these centres, as, as one councillor has just said, it's terrific. Outreach in schools and so on. It's really key in turning around all of our, you know, less contaminants, how it's important. And in the aims that you state at the beginning, it really is key to emphasise to our residents why this is part of our, um, you know, our climate change emergency fight back. And, um, and so I was, you know, I think that you, the aims that you have uh, are excellent. It's a superb report, but um, are there any plans other than that one additional officer, as far as you're aware, at the moment? Or is that just not realistic at the moment? Th thank you, Councillor. And just, just to add that, I think I'd like to reinforce that because absolutely right. You said that behaviour change takes a long time. And for that, for us to make that really effective, we've got to target our young people. Young people at the moment are engaged with the climate change agenda more so than ever you know, in the, in, in the last kind of decade. So this is an opportune time to actually engage with them on, the, on, on, on this. So I agree with my colleagues. I think we need to look at, I know, I know you're already doing it, but look at pushing more resources towards our young people in terms of educating them on, on this. I'll certainly review it. I think what was in my mind when I was writing the plan was that we've got two education centres. So even if they're fully booked Monday to Friday and we've got an officer each on those, we've got another officer to go out and do the outreach. I'll certainly look at capacity to see whether that can be um, stretched into a, a full-time position. But the other thing we are doing is working with some of the local authorities have got their own education officers. So I know Rochdale definitely do. And we've worked to help train them up to give them the same messages. And um, Manchester do through BIFA as well. So we work very closely with them. Um, so I know they're doing a lot of work in schools as well. So I think we need to map out um, the gap in the resources, if you like, once we've established... Um, we, we want to review where the schools are coming from to the centres and put a plan together so that we know we can target certain areas that are not getting covered. So I know that Rochdale schools, Berry schools actually as well, I know that Talat does a lot of work in schools. So there's quite a lot going on. We want to map out where the gaps are and then I can have a look at whether that means that, yes, we actually we do need a full-time officer instead of a part-time one. Thank you. Uh, I, I've got a couple of things. The, the reuse shops, and I, I may be wrong, but when, when the, uh, we had discussions around the sewers contract, I thought these reuse shops were going to be actually out in the community rather than at the household waste recycling centres. And I remember once, I think Harper here was mentioned in North Manchester somewhere. Now, a couple of councillors have already mentioned in terms of communication. How are we going to allow the residents to know that there is this shop there the way you can actually not only you go to this center but not only you know take your stuff there but you can make get bargain items as well and the other one is uh, on uh, carpets and mattresses is that anybody can take a carpet and mattress does that include traders as well because i'd imagine most residents would find it difficult to fit a mattress in their in their car or, or, or even even a carpet and and what would happen is they dispose of it through a, a, a man and van man and so how is that going to work uh, yes, yeah, so the reuse shops, there was always um, three based at the local house waste recycling centres. Suez also do have an ambition to open up something in Manchester as well, I think the northern quarter. But that was um, an ambition and something that will be worked through once they've set up the reuse shops. Um, they actually run reuse shops on other contracts, so they've got a lot of experience of doing this. And they're very proud of them, so there will be a big bang approach to PR once we've got dates um, ready for the opening of the shop. So everyone will know about it. Hopefully we'll do a, quite a, a long comms lead up to this. Um, in terms of the carpets and mattresses, it's just a trial to collect household um, carpets and mattresses because obviously traders are not allowed to access the HWRCs. So this is just a small trial to access, um, to assess the level of demand for this. But then um, sewers have also committed to building a mattress recycling plant at one of our sites. So this is um, the startings of a, a, a trial, which will then be rolled out at all the HWRCs. So the, they've put containers on. Um, I can't remember the locations in uh, Bolton and Berry, I think. Um, containers there for carpets and for mattresses. 
and they're going to trial that and then roll it out um, in 2020. So, so people would have to take the mattress on the carpets to those containers? Yeah, they currently do at the moment. We have a lot of carpets and mattresses that come in, but obviously they go into the burnable skip at the moment, so they know that the, the, we've got a lot of material there. So now we're hoping to recycle it and capture that. A lot of carpets and mattresses end up in fly tipping as well, so I was hoping we'd have something where it make it easier for people to kind of, uh, you know, dispose of them. From a householder's perspective, they will now have the ability to recycle those materials mm -hmm. on the household waste recycling centres. Mm -hmm. If it's traders, they will have to use mm -hmm. the Weybridge facilities as mm -hmm. they do now mm -hmm. and pay for the disposal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions on this item? Councillor Quinn. It's regarding that email I sent you about the coffee cups that have been sent to all 10 districts, as in these coffee cups are recyclable, and when you did the research with sewers, well, no, they're not actually, pal. Um, sorry. But I think that, that the problem is you're getting a lot of manufacturers coming forward and saying this is recyclable, and I think 38 to 40 percent of all plastic packaging is wrong. And it's how we get maybe to a national standard of, of saying that it's when people say to me as a councillor, what can go in the plastic bin? They say one thing on, one thing only, you know, bottles, everything else goes in the grey bin in Berry. And it's getting that message across, but manufacturers are misleading people and it makes our job a lot harder. And I don't know how we get around that, but you know, obviously that manufacturer who sent the email has got a vested interest. That's in, they might have invested in, they've invested in the wrong technology. But it's not our fault, so um, I don't know how we get that message over. I know that um, sewers are doing some work lobbying government about this sort of problem. Um, and I know through our contacts as well, I don't know if, if you're doing it through Plastic Free as well, yeah. um, in terms of feeding back to DEFRA about these sorts of issues. Um, I know that uh, Adam Reid, who works, is the external um, corporate affairs manager at Suez, is working on uh, with DEFRA in particular on the labelling to try and suggest alternative types of labelling that's a bit clearer because the labelling just doesn't really help people. It confuses people. If you look on the packaging, it says widely recycled and it's not. So the, there is a lot of work going on in the background, but uh, it, it's not going to be a quick win because it, there's so many different products out there. It, it's not an easy one. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Councillor Larry. Sorry to keep harping back about my visit, but it, it was one of the things that was brought to our attention in that the nationally they they use the, the sign and lots of lots of lots of them do. And and again it's a it's breaking through in, in respect of communication to to our residents because they look at that and they think it's recyclable and it's and it's it's not. It's it's a, a misnomer in that in most instances. Thank you. Right, next item, item 10, is uh, uh, the Plastic Free GM campaign, and it's Sarah. Can you, can you switch your mic on? Sorry. The, yeah, the report sets out um, the work which we've been doing initially at the Green Summit it was based um, on tourist and hospitality, trying to, to drive single-use plastic um, out of that industry. But given um, the enormous amount of interest within this, it's quite vastly extended. Um, you'll see that we've done a public sector plastic pact. Um, Stockport also have, have just recently signed the pledge Bolton, it's going to their next committee meeting, so please say it's just Manchester, which we, we, we're just hoping to get them over the line before Christmas. Um, in terms then, we have done some pilots on water fountains. Um, there's an error in this, which it says um, that it's in Stockport, where it should have been actually Tameside. So, sorry about that. Um, in terms then, we've had quite a good turnout of hospitality, have moved, we've 
had over um, half a million uh, straws to date um, of our paper B straw, which I know has come to yourselves previously. Um, work is continuing. We have a zone, um, Greater Manchester Green Carrier Scheme, um, and that's been promoted so that we can move away from, from single-use plastic bags and have something which can go through our vessel composters. We're also working with universities as well to get um, plastic-free campuses on board. I'm happy to take any questions. Members? Councillor? Thanks, Chair. Uh, so, you know, the, um, the first ever the, the Plastic Free Conference was in Berry last year. Are we, are we planning to do another one? Yes, so we, we worked with um, both procurement officers, sustainability, environment and waste officers to look how we might tackle this in public estate. From that, we got quite a comprehensive report with a, a raft of recommendations. Um, we will be setting up something in the new year. Districts have been at this moment in time doing audits on what their plastic estates look like. We'll then look to take that forward um, and look at, at what procurements we, we then have a procurement framework which looks at the green agenda to look at all various different elements of sustainability including uh, plastics and recyclable content as well. Any, any other? Okay. In terms of your, uh, the, the carrier scheme, what sort of take-up have we had with the retailers, the one that started at the start of this year? Thank you. And are, are we talking about the high street retailers or small, medium size? Um, it's aimed that anybody can actually have it. So whilst Towers has um, Greater Manchester doing things differently, that logo can be taken off and any, any retailer's logo can be put on that. Um, it still has as our branding at the bottom of the bag. Um, so yeah, it, it's very diversible that anybody could use it. It's, it's at no cost to the retailers as well, so it, they sell it basically at cost. So it looks very similar to sort of your, your co-op bag. Thank you. Members, any further questions? Council Fastergram. Yes, sorry. I j just, just wanted to clarify. I mean, you know, well done. It's a fantastic work. It's a drop in the ocean, I mean, unfortunately. Um, it, uh, you know, because I'm sure we all want to be more ambitious and, and several of us have raised this several times about plastics recycling and the frustrations of the existence and lack of market and so on. But, but this is, it's a small part, but it's an important part, so well done. I just wanted to be absolutely clear, because I didn't quite hear, I'm sorry. At the beginning, when you said about the um, plastic-free uh, GM pledge, um, you said, is that where you said that it should have read Stockport? No, Stockport have actually, since, since this report has been written, Stockport have signed the pledge. Oh, sorry, I didn't put, yeah. That's, um, yes, thank you. So, uh, and time and time. So, are we, are we all in now? Are all the 10 authorities in the plastic pledge or not? Just one, not. Uh, who, sorry, which authority is that? Manchester. Manchester's not in it yet. Right, OK. I'll take that back and get back to you. <laughs> Councillor Quinn. Yeah, just to pick up what, what Helen said about yeah, we're, we're doing great, but, I mean, we're, we're an, an authority, we're a big one, but this will only come, in my mind, when we get the, the movement on the English waste strategy, where you get extended producer responsibility, where government says... You've got to do that to manufacturers where it's within law. And then we bring in the deposit return scheme where we have to start paying for it. And, and the, the proof is, is in the, the facts. In Norway, they've got 95% recycling rate for single-use plastic bottles because it's a deposit return scheme. So we can do what we want, and we're doing a great job skirting around the edges. But once, I mean, the, the, the best of one is, is, is a 5p tax on a carrier bag. 
You know, there's no riots in the streets. When you, when you go and shopping, wherever you're going, the, the first question you say is, have you got the, have you got the, the carrier bags? You know, you get the bags for life. And so that, that must come from us, neither in government, to say, you've produced this document, quite pro very progressive, how are you going to implement it in law? So then the, the manufacturers, the misleaders, the people who are, who are putting all this junk out have to obey the law like the rest of us. So I think that's, you know, that's got to come from us, from, you know, from pressure. Yeah, um, I'm down in London at the start of, of next month to see RAP, to see DEFRA, and those are exactly the, the points which we'll be making, is that you know, we, we need help in this, this field and we need it to come quickly. Thank you. Any more further questions on that? Right, we'll move to the next item, which is uh, the asset management plan update, and that's Michael. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Does I have a pointer on that? Just like, okay. Thank you. Uh, my report just covers on assets and engineering works in general. I have a, a presentation on some slides which will focus on uh, construction works at Brevary and Covenant Street on the MBT modifications, which I'll come on to just in a moment. But just as a general overview to the report, um, what I've done in the report is I've just set out how our assets are categorised now since Suez have taken over as our new operator. So we typically split out the sites now into A, B and C. A covering waste facilities, that covers 39 different assets and technologies across 22 locations. Then we have some subsidiaries and bits of land parcels, uh, which is across seven different locations. And they're usually adjacent to or parallel to some of our operational sites. There's parcels of land which are outside the lease boundary areas. So some of those we're looking to maybe sell on and develop, and it's just about managing them and managing the risks that comes with those. Uh, item C, category C, is our uh, closed landfill sites, which some members will be aware previously that we used to have a larger portfolio up to 22 landfill sites. 18 of those were passed on to uh, POS Landcare, who manage the risks and liabilities with those sites, and four we currently manage in-house. So what I've done in the report is just set out uh, those items in individual sites, because our profile of risk and management and how we manage the assets has changed with the contract slightly. We're essentially more involved in the waste facility management of those assets with Suez, uh, rather than relying on the operator to look after the assets on our behalf. Um, Part two of the report covers Bebry and Cobden, which I'll come on to just at the end. Uh, in terms of some of the land sites that we have and parcels of land, we look after Dunkirk Farm. It's currently uh, been negotiated as a sale agreement at the moment. It's been a risk profile for us for quite a while with some antisocial behaviour. It's a, an abandoned farm with some outbuildings, and we're hoping to conclude that sale now before Christmas. It's, things are moving quite swiftly on that. Two of our other sites of note that I've just mentioned briefly, I'll give in brief introductions and current positions are associated with Brebury and Waitlands, our closed landfill sites. The, the update here is just to say that we're, there's no progress on engineering works currently on those sites. That's essentially due to our resources being concentrated on delivering the new MBT and MTR facilities at Covid and Brebury. That project's been ongoing for over two years with my involvement and the team in the last 12 months has been a priority for us. That's not to say that we haven't been monitoring and managing those other sites, it's just we haven't progressed with uh, uh, engineering works on those sites. So what I've provided in the report as well, in, in part A as an appendice in part B, is a look forward to what we're doing over the next four years to reschedule some of those priorities for 20, uh, 20 and 21. So we're, we're currently looking at 13 different schemes uh, across the annual period for next year. So what I'd like to do now, if well, I'd be happy to take any questions in general on the report before I move on to the presentation. Members? No, move on. Mike. No, great, thank you. So, as I mentioned very briefly, over the past two years, since um, October 2017, we first became involved in uh, looking at uh, reconditioning the existing MBT plants for the future for uh, for the future operator, which is now, as we know, Suez. So initially we looked at delivering three uh, MBTs and turning them into MTRs. And that was basically stripping out the biological treatment process within those plants and simplifying how we receive waste, what we do with it, and how we process it on those plants. 
So what we ended up doing was delivering two projects or commencing to deliver two projects and um, we're, we're currently just at the end, the final hurdle at Brevary as we speak at the moment. So if I can give you a brief introduction to the project scope, it, it was basically to simplify the plants uh, processing to receive shred and compact waste to create an RDF source. The RDF source would then be transferred by train uh, and rail to Runcorn. Remove complex and onerous wet site treatment and AD technology. I've got a couple of slides later on which will give you a bit of a background into how complex the existing sites were and how, how far we've gone in the simplification. But essentially, the organics extraction from the waste processing plants and the creation of the AD systems were very complicated, very costly to, to manage as, a, as an OPEX, as an operational process in terms of staff, maintenance, electricity and, and high demand. So, as part of the project as well, we look to increase the capacity, so that's uh, up, up, operating our tonnage and throughput, and what you could actually put through those facilities. By simplifying them, we were able to essentially put more waste through the plant on an annual basis. And our targets for Brebury on the design criteria were 120 tonnes per year, and then 100 tonnes of Cobden Street per year. A key principle for this was a bit of dialogue with the previous operator and the staff on site was to provide good operational access and maintenance, because this was a significant issue for the operator, which impacted us in terms of cost of management and overheads on those particular sites. So we looked to engage with staff on site and to make more simple, accessible conveyors and, and arrangements. Uh, obviously, uh, reducing the overhead, overhead costs and operational costs on an annual basis was, was a key target as well. The minimum lifespan we put in for, it, for, it, for the conveyors was 15 years. Uh, typically, a building will be around 25 years plus in this particular case with wear and tear, it's quite uh, aggressive year on year depending on what you get in the waste stream and how much tonnage you put through. So our expected minimum uh, lifespan is 15 years for these two contracts. And bear in mind, members might be aware as well of the timelines. This was all to be delivered uh, whilst we were undergoing the contract negotiations and procurement to, to a pint Suez at that time. So for us as a team internally, it was quite difficult because we had a, a current operator to deal with and we didn't know who the prospective new operator would be at that time we delivered the plants. So the projects were very simple uh, in, in theory, but very complicated to deliver uh, on site. They covered three main areas. Enabling works were all the risks to the existing services, such as electrics, fire alarms, CCTV, lighting, odor control, and many other areas. But they were some of the key areas. That was the, the authority's risk, that was for us to deliver, for us to, to deliver before those installations weren't were able to go ahead. We also split out a second package of civil engineering works because we had to take down existing push walls and concrete infrastructure to simplify the sites, to put up new push walls and, and make the sites uh, more amenable to, uh, to what we wanted to do. And then finally, we looked at two separate mechanical and electrical installation contracts with, with previous uh, providers for both those sites at Covenant and Bredbury. Uh, that was a long uh, drawn procedure where we had to look at the design criteria, the commercial discussions and contracts. So over the first year between October 2017 up until the back end of 2018, there was lots of reviews and designs, uh, specifications, commercial discussions to get those contracts in place. Um, we delivered on those and we eventually then got ourselves to site early last year. So a bit of a, an overview on the programme for the actual construction and installation work. At Cobden Street, that plant is now delivered, as David mentioned previously. It's, uh, it's set up with mobilisation, was the first instance in March. The CDM handover, which uh, takes responsibility onto our principal contractor in April. We had part, partial handover of that site of the tipping hall, that's to relieve some stress and pressure on the, uh, on the waste streams, so we could receive waste into the hall but not actually process it. And then finally, completion of the handover on the 9th of September at Cobden. Uh, since the 9th of September, we, we get, we're getting weekly tonnages and, and monthly tonnages up since then. Um, I'm glad to say that we're meeting the targets set out in the contract. And feedback from the operator has been positive to date that the plant is, is doing what, it's, what it was designed to do. At Bredbury, a similar scenario taking us from April through to November. Uh, we've just recently handed back the full tipping hall area back to the operator Suez and we're currently uh, on the final hurdle for completion of the mechanical and electrical installation, which uh, I hope to be uh, early in December. So th this graph here, Cobden Street, uh, really just, give, I'm trying to give you an impression of how complicated the site was. 
without overcomplicating the sketch, if that makes sense. So you can see the actions uh, from number one through to number nine, where you would take waste into the reception, into the tipping hall. This would then go into a shredder. It would then be conveyed up in a route between two, three and four and into a large sieve drum where different fraction sizes would be extracted from that sieve drum. I think from memory the fractions were between 0 and 150 and 150 to 300. They would then uh, flow into the mechanical process hall for further processing where the organic fractions would be separated for recovery. That, that would take the organic stream into the anaerobic digestion process where the gas would be created from that to split the organics back out. So the impression I'm trying to give you here is how complicated and onerous the plant was at that time. Uh, we also took off uh, RDF through the compactors, methods recovery for ferrous and non-ferrous, at the top of the tipping hall, and you can see where the bulky waste outlet goes. So the red line is the simplified route of the plan of what we wanted to do. It's very much an A to B route. It's receive, shred, uh, and compact. This, these two pictures here are uh, Cobden Street before we went in to do the modifications. And again, it's just to emphasize the, how many screens, conveyors, changes, and you can just you can imagine and assume how much maintenance heavy that is as well, just to replace a belt or to, to make sure the rollers are all in place on the conveyors, the electrics, the e-stop systems, the, the emergency call points, the fire alarms, the sprinkler system, etc., etc. It's quite onerous just to give you that impression. So this is a, a, a quite a neat schematic, a 3D schematic supplied by our contractor for Cobden Street. And you can see the process now is far simplified. So we've retained the tipping hole. What I've not shown in that particular sketch is the bulky output. The bulky output still uh, exists in, in the tipping hole. But we, we take in residual waste that goes into a shredder and it's conveyed across uh, from two to three up onto four, where we have two sets of overbed magnets to take out ferrous materials. Those ferrous materials are just taken out into containers uh, to extract those from the waste streams because it's part of our contract with Runcorn for the RDF delivery. And then we, we invested heavily on the existing compactors on site, uh, item number five, to operate the, uh, the pressure within those compactors because we're delivering waste faster on the conveyors through a simplified route. So the compactors had to be operated mechanically to allow for a greater pressure to go into the compactors. Um, so it just really, if you go back, if I go back to that sketch, it's just, it's just to emphasize our premise across the sites and what we wanted to achieve in simplifying the sites. So the photographs here just give you an insight into construction, uh, taking us from April through to August. Uh, the first one, number one in April, is, uh, is deconstruction and demolition work of the tipping hall. Uh, two is moving on uh, to the next month in May where we've erected the new push wall alignments. Just to give you a typical uh, feel for what we've been doing across the project. Number three is we took an opportunity, uh, you can see steel plating on the existing push walls. Um, it's very rare that we would get an opportunity to have a, a free tipping hall. And uh, part of our responsibility is to make sure we manage the assets for the longer term. So we took the opportunity to uh, apply steel sheeting plates, metal plates to the, to the tipping hall push walls to, to basically give the, the walls a longer lifespan because they take a lot of force and impact from the machinery and from the waste being dropped off. Uh, picture number four shows you the, uh, the process mechanical hall. Uh, in the background, you can see the, the old trommel. This was a, a very dangerous operation for us to remove, very technical. Uh, we had very tight uh, openings within the walls to get that out. It had to be taken down and dismantled and burnt up and taken off site because we, had a, we have a very small yard at the back of the site where the railway head is. So it was a, it was a time consuming item uh, with us and the contractor and a risk item as well. I happen to say actually across this site, we've had a couple of minor injuries but no significant health and safety issues on site. And everything with the contractor and with the operator was managed very well. Uh, Photograph number five shows you the cleared process tipping hall and, and then six and seven to show you the installation process with, for the new mechanical plant. You'll note on uh, photograph number five, the green compactors to the right hand side and I, uh, photograph number seven shows you how we've engaged with those to simplify the, uh, the waste transfer into the compactors. Uh, photograph eight is then, I think that I took that one during commissioning, so it gives you a, an insight into the waste fraction what comes through the shredder and what, what comes down the conveyor belt. 
and and really that's that's Cobden in essence. I didn't want to go into it in too much detail, but it just gives you a flavour for what we've been doing since uh, uh, March last year, delivering two projects. And it's been uh, this project at Cobden is a little bit more simplified. The Brebbery one's a little bit more complicated in terms of the civil engineering works and the risks we had at that site was slightly different. This was very straightforward. The biggest risk profile we had across this site and both sites is enabling works is making sure we we get all the services rearranged because as you can imagine uh, the investment over 10 years ago into the technologies as part of the PFI it was never envisaged that we would come back to simplify the plants in this manner and then have to manage the services so that, that's been a, a learning curve for us internally as a team and it's been a, the biggest hurdle we had to cover um, Redbury is slightly different but uh, the premises is very much the same so on the sketch that's shown here, the tipping hall up to the top left hand side, you can see that it's a U-shaped tipping hall. Um, not the best layout for, uh, for vehicle movements coming in and out through the roller shutter doors. The green section in that tipping hall is where the, exist, where the previous shredder was located. And then if you follow the process into the mechanical process hall, it's complicated and onerous as breviary, but I didn't want to, to, to go through that in this particular sketch, but I think you, you get the impression. There's a lot of planting and equipment within the hall and the process, processing hall, and then again within the wet side. So the wet side, for example, that all hatched in yellow, that area is now redundant as part of our decision making and what we've done to simplify the sites. And this will form part of future works now coming on this year. And I'm currently uh, scoping out um, design and specification works to go to tender for that to get the site next April, possibly, ho hopefully next April, if the timelines are correct, to strip that plant out because it, we've now left with a lot, a lot of redundant planting equipment. Um, so you can see some of the photographs on the, on the bottom of the side which show you the, the plant and the arrangements and how it was facilitated. These three are quite good. The, the top left shows you the tipping hall on the, on the U-shaped section. Uh, you can see how it really encroached on the, on the tipping hall floor. And in, in peak periods around December, usually around this time of the year, that tipping hall would fill up very quickly. Uh, the top right hand side shows you the pre-shredder arrangements and there's quite a lot of lost space in, in some equipment that was there previously over the past 10 years which wasn't utilised which is why we decided to take all that construction down. The bottom photograph is the incline conveyor which you can't see on the top left hand side but you can just about in the distance see the grab machine. So that grab machine would feed the shredder which was based at a, at a basement level which was a legacy issue from the MBT at Brevery over last 20, 30 years from how that facility was constructed and then adapted and now adapted again. So we've, we've taken that out basically to simplify the site. Um, just to go back, sorry, the red line then also indicates our simple approach yet again. Uh, the top section of the tipping hall, we've relocated the, the, the shredder and it's a route A to B to convey the waste, the shredded waste to the compactors. So the new layouts here, they provide a couple of photographs as well of some of our installation. Um, we went with a very simple approach on the conveyor, but we had to create a, an inclined conveyor and take it through an existing structural wall. You can see that on the right hand side as it comes through the wall. So that was, uh, it was a very simple idea, uh, complicated to deliver because we had to cut a hole in the wall. And the wall is probably five to 600 millimeters thick. So it had to be done by uh, extremely high pressure uh, jetting head. Uh, hydro demolition so it was, uh, it was done very neatly and very successfully. Um, the picture on the left hand side that's the incline conveyor which on the sketch is on the bottom side of the sketch and that's uh, the conveyor on the, on the top sketch is the incline conveyor as you can see it comes from a ground level and up onto an, over, an overvan magnet uh, in, on top of two new compactors. So the premise at both sides was to it was to leave as much of the of the conveyors at ground level for ma management and maintenance. So typically at chest height, so you can get in, get some maintenance done, get your arms in around the motors and freely. Because you, as you've seen on the previous plants, you had conveyors running in various different directions and it's very difficult to get to some of the motors to replace them or even indeed replace the belts. So some construction photographs across at Bredbury. Um, number one is the, the old tipping hall wall and uh, the demolition work to take that down. Um, it's, it's safe to say that these sites were built to last as well, so it, it, we came across lots of steel and lots of uh, 
lots of issues with trying to take it down. Um, I was actually talking to a um, mechanical installer from our contractor and it took them two hours to drill one hole in the slab and they had to drill more than 30. So just to give you an idea of what we were up against and the amount of steel that was put in there, it was, it was certainly well built at the time. Uh, photograph number two shows you the, uh, the, the, the wall that's been taken down. And then I previously mentioned the basement level, number three. Uh, waste previously dropped into that lower section, uh, which was then conveyed up into the mechanical process hall. So we've infilled that now to simplify the process. Uh, photograph number four is then true into the mechanical hall where we're clearing out for the new compactors. Five gives you a good insight to what we've got now. These were taken uh, uh, just recently over the past month. So we have a new uh, tipping hall, which is more of a rectangular shape. Uh, the waste you see in the top left hand side is split be between a concrete wall and that's for fire protection to reduce the massive waste and it also gives the operator a bit more flexibility about how they want to store waste at each side of the tipping hall. The hopper on the bottom right hand side of that photograph is where the new uh, shredder has been relocated. What we look to do as part of this contract as well and with Cobden is retain some of our assets um, and repurpose them uh, so we don't have to, to replace them because it's exceptionally uh, cost intensive exercise. Photograph number six shows what we refer to as the banana conveyor as that runs up from the ground up, up, up to the outside section. Uh, photograph number seven then you see that conveyor come through the wall and you can see how it's engaged with the existing electrics. Luckily we had a, a, a gap how that uh, cabling arrangement was, uh, was aligned otherwise that would have been a, a dip more difficult scenario for us to overcome. Below that incline conveyor at Picture number seven is the existing bulky crush and that's been retained. And then this slide, which is number eight, shows you our new compactors. And we have a pendulum system, so this is a different design as compared to Cobden. It's quite unique, it's not something we've seen before, but it's very simplistic and rudimentary. And we're hoping that it will, uh, it will stand the test of time on the contract. Uh, at Brebury, we retained the shredder and we decided to invest our money in, in providing new compactors. Again, we're processing the waste faster. We want to get up the, uh, the rate at Brebury to get the throughput through the plant as well. So we felt that was a, a good investment on the project. And that's essentially a bit of a, a whistle-stop tour of what we've been doing. Uh, hopefully conclusion at Brebury will come uh, now over the next couple of weeks, but it's been a, a difficult program for us of construction, but it's been, been worthwhile. It's been a, a good project to work on. I think we've done quite well to deliver it with all the risk profiles we've had. This slide just gives you a bit of an insight onto uh, waste facility assets and some future works we've got coming ahead. Um, so at Brebury and Cobden, just because we've done the, the installations doesn't mean we stop because we have to manage the redundant equipment and we have to provide new order control or re rejuvenate the order control system and dust extraction systems on those sites. And then there's some various works that will move on with uh, services for lighting and CCTV that need to be implemented now in the coming 12 months. At Longley Lane, uh, as Justin I think mentioned earlier, we've got some refurbishments to the MERF, uh, which will be delivered by Suez. And we're currently in discussions with um, creating a new MTR at Longley Lane as well. So that's a conversion very similar to the two projects I've just shown you. It's to strip out old complicated processing with AD components and simplify to receive shred and compact. And the works uh, programs are currently ongoing with um, Suez. Uh, no doubt I'll probably be providing an update on those as we move forward, but we're at, in the early stages on both projects at the moment. Um, on Chichester, Chichester Street, the new bio waste uh, centre. So work, groundworks have gone really well on that and the piles have been tested and that's all come back satisfactory. So that was a big risk profile for us on that site. Um, and I'm looking ahead further to 21, 22, uh, we'll eventually have to get around to decommissioning and dismantling of the AD tanks and processes on those sites. And there'll be engagement with the operator sewers and ourselves as to how we decide to take that forward. So that's it for me. I hope that was informative and I'm, I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you, Michael. Uh, whistle stop, but it's quite comprehensive. So members? Thanks, Michael. Um, so this this is sort of starting off. This is sort of the residual waste. Yeah. So when it starts off, it goes through the shredders. What happens if we shred a lithium-ion battery? Have we got? A, I'm just think. I'm trying to think of anything that might go wrong with it. And 
Second one is you've, we've got the, the overband magnets for ferrous, but what about aluminium? And what the other thing I'm just thinking of is any glass or plastic. I, so, but how do we sort all that out? Is this question asking? So the battery one, just to take that one first, that would be an occurrence that would have happened with the old plants, of course. Not something we can control, but I would expect that that would be thorough operation from Suez to manage that. They will have risk assessments and mitigations in place to identify any risks that come in. Uh, one thing I would say is that if you think back to the photographs and how complicated the conveyor routes were, it would be more difficult to spot an obstruction or a lithium battery as such or a small fire. On these particular sites, it would be a lot easier to manage. So I think we've reduced the risk profile because it should be easier to monitor and to observe. Um, in terms of the waste streams and the, the ferrous versus non-ferrous, that's a good question. Uh, we have to bear in mind what we tried to deliver here was, was upfront uh, for Suez to manage over the longer term of the contract. What we would envisage is probably discussing how we want to separate out ferrous against non-ferrous in the future. And once we clear out those large halls, those processing halls, we think there may be some a possibility for us to do some ventures there to do that. So it's not something we've agreed or decided upon, but it's certainly something that we're, we're thinking about. Um, and in terms of last and other waste streams that come into the site, that would again go down to a good communications input from colleagues as well to try and divert that from the residual waste. But they would be taken on board into the shredder as, as a whole. There is no separation or sieving out of glass or materials. So whatever you receive on, on, the, on the floor, on the tipping hall, will be processed through the shredder. Thank you. Mr. Brown. Yes, thank you. I, I will just make a comment because um, I think, you know, the, uh, that was a really helpful, really um, interesting presentation. Thank you so much to Michael and his team. Um, I think this, the scale of some of the engineering challenges that you faced is probably, um, you know, not fully understood by everybody. But I, I think that you, you've, you've done a, a very good job there, particularly when you think that, um, you know, this is reducing the risk profile, the safe, safety aspects and the efficiency of these plants, which helps us meet our aim. So I'd just like to thank you and your team very much on behalf of uh, Stockport for all that, you, that you're doing to, to achieve the objectives. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, and, and I think I second that, and I think the rest of us do as well. Thank you, Michael. There's clearly a lot of work's gone into that, so uh, well done. Right, next we've got the, uh, the dates and times of the next two meetings. Uh, 16th of Jan and the 12th of March. Venues to be, I think, confirmed yet, but... Right, okay. Uh, but you'll get plenty of notice on that. Next item is the exclusion of the press and the public. So I don't think there's any... No, they've got better things to do. Yeah. Yes. Has that been done now?